Okay, welcome to Tuesday's lecture. It's a brand new week. It's the last week. Um, so we are picking up where we left off last lecture, last Thursday. We talked about the uh, Young's double slit experiment and introduced the notion of uh, when light is acting like a wave, it can interfere with itself, which is kind of cool. And as it passes through two small slits, and it can cause an interference pattern. And the premise of that is superposition of waves, which we introduced that idea in Physics 136, which is, I suppose, in part, why Physics 136 is a prerequisite uh, for this class. Uh, we also introduced the notion of a path difference being the very, very key element in the Young's double slit experiment that uh, it's the path difference that says when the path difference between the two to the, the two light ray waves is is a uh, an whole number multiple of lambda, then the two light waves will will hit the screen in phase and become very bright. And if they are um, uh, half a lambda, some multiple of half lambda, so like half lambda 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5. Um, if they are shifted by half lambda apart when they reach their destination, then they will be completely out of phase and they will still superimpose, but then destructively interfere and then you get dark spot altogether. And we, we sort of formulated, just actually let me scroll up here to remind you, we sort of formulated uh, two equations uh, for the locations of the bright spots and the dark spots based on the fringe number m, the fringe number m, and the angle, the, the angle that is impossible to measure, sine theta. And that sine theta, just as a, as a reminder, that sine theta is measured there. And, and I fully understand in real life, you would not be able to measure that. That is not a measurable angle uh, in, in the lab. So we will address that later in this lecture. We will use an approximation and hopefully it gets the job done. Uh, the very last thing I left you with on Thursday was I was explaining to you what the fringe numbers were. And uh, I was wanting to do that before the weekend to give you some time. If, if you happen to have a chance to do some homework, you wouldn't be left in the dark, uh, no pun intended, uh, with, with the terminology fringe number. So you now know what the M is the fringe number. You can talk about the, set, the, the central maximum, which is the zero with fringe or the subsequent bright spots we call fringe number one, fringe number two, fringe number three. And then same with the dark spot. The dark spots um, doesn't have a central dark spot. So the zero with order fringe is the first dark spot to the left and or to the right of the center. Um, okay. Now you see here, let me scroll up for a second. You see here that this, the location of the bright spots and also the dark spots is a function of wavelength. So I'll say here location, location of bright uh, and dark is a function of lambda, wavelength. So if you shined, uh, let's say a red laser, a red laser is monochromatic, mono meaning one, chromatic meaning color. So a laser is monochromatic and it only has one light. So if you shine a, a red laser through a Young's double slit, then you're just gonna get a very well-defined uh, interference pattern. Maybe, maybe perhaps like the one we're seeing here on this slide. However, what's really interesting and, and really cool is in the previous chapter with refraction, we talked about how a prism is able to separate white light into its rainbow or, or into its constituent colors. And the reason for this was, well, refraction. And um, the index of refraction, uh, as you saw, uh, is, is often uh, a function of the, of the frequency of light. We called that dispersion. And uh, just to recap, while we're here, I'm just gonna quickly jump back to that slide here just to show you kind of what I'm talking about. Here it is here, that the index of refraction um, for a certain wavelength or, or frequency uh, changes. So, you know, with blue light, the index of refraction tends to be higher, not a lot higher, but a little bit higher. And uh, for red light, uh, the index of refraction seems to go down a little bit. So there's less bending. 
So uh, the more blue the light is, the more bending there is. And that is what gets us the prism. Because when you put white light in, uh, blue light bends more. So you see here the blue light will come in, it will bend more and, uh, and separate from the other colors and red light will bend the least. So interestingly, an interesting caveat of, oops, wrong, there we go. An interesting caveat uh, of, of a Young's double slit experiment is because you still have that sort of lambda dependence, that wave -like, uh, sorry, the, the wavelength dependence, you actually also have another way of, of breaking apart the, uh, the color spectrum as if you had a prism. So the central bright spot is just white light because there is no refracting there. And whether, whether you have blue light, red light, green light, orange light, you know, all, all the frequencies, all the lambdas will have the central bright spot, period. However, the location of the first bright spot, and if you recall, it was M sine theta equals M lambda. So the first bright spot, oops, the first bright spot, is going to be uh, m equals 1. Obviously, that's the first bright spot. So if you're solving for uh, location, then you'd say something like sine theta equals lambda over d. d is the slit width, lambda is the wavelength. So the location is, is governed by theta. The, the, the larger the theta, the different locations there will be on the screen. So if you if you have uh, blue light, for instance, blue light is around 400 nanometers. So blue, actually, if I was smart about this, I would write blue in blue ink. Blue wavelength has a lambda of about 400 nanometers. Nano times 10 to the minus 9. And red light has a lambda of about 700 nanometers. So you see from this equation that the bigger the lambda value, the, the um, well, bigger the angle will be. The, the bigger the numerator, the, the bigger the angle. So uh, blue light has a smaller wavelength, so it'll have the smaller the angle. So you can predict from the equation the pattern that you expect to see in reality. You expect to see that the first maximum for blue light is, is uh, not as far away. And the first maximum for red light is farther away. And in fact, that's exactly what we see when you shine white light through a Young's double slit. You see the central bright spot. However, you see purple and blue light uh, first, and then it sort of spreads out like a rainbow. And it does that because of this equation. Sine theta equals lambda over d. It's the same d for all the light, but it's a different lambda for all the light. So you can sort of mimic a prism this way. So I, I just think that is super cool. Uh, I'm probably the only one, well, actually, you no, know, Romina's on the call. She probably, she probably also thinks it's really cool. But um, we are perhaps the only two who think that's just really cool. Um, now, um, we, can, we can take this a step further. I, oh, I always have to click this twice, and I'm not sure why. OK. So I told you we would come back. Oh, they're going to see twice. It's always twice. I told you we would come back and deal with, um, deal with the fact that sine theta is not measurable. So here, uh, I'll say recall. Recall that the formula, let's say for bright, because um, this, this procedure will be the same for bright spots and dark spots. So let's just, just use bright spots for lack of general, uh, without loss of generality. So recall the bright spot equation was d sine theta equals m lambda. And we got this equation from looking at this sort of triangle in here, where this was theta, this was d, and this was the path difference. And the path difference in the, in the bright scenario was m lambda. OK? So here, this was a right angle. So here, we were able to say that sine theta is equal to um, opposite over adjacent, so m lambda over d. That's, that's where this equation came from. Now, I told you that that sine theta is, in, 
not just hard, but like impossible to, to measure in, um, in person in, in a lab. So what's happening here is if you had a screen really far away, and when I say really far, I don't actually mean really far. I just mean, well, I'll, I'll explain. Um, if you had a screen here, then you'd see actually the bright spots. Oh, I should really start with drawing the, the central maximum here. Okay. So there's the screen and the screen is what shows um, the interference pattern. It could either be a piece of paper, it could be a cloth, um, it could be the, the screen that the, the uh, lecture projector projects on in the lecture room, the electric screen that comes down, and literally any physical object that can be used as a screen. So here's, here's something else. If, if we are talking about this location here, let's say this is the mth bright spot. All right. Then we can now, I guess I didn't draw this perfectly because I should probably draw this to scale there, there, theta. Okay. So that's the theta. Now here's the other thing. We can, we can construct this triangle here and this distance is going to be the distance between the slit and the screen. And that's easily measurable in real life because you're the one holding the double slit and you can easily take a meter stick or, or a ruler or what have, what have you and measure the distance between the screen where it's being shown and the, the slit, the, the double slit that you're holding. And that, that's something that's easily measurable in, in real life. So this is easy, easily measurable uh, in real life. And the other thing that's easily measurable in real life is this distance here. So let's call this the y-axis because it's vertical. So let's call this the y-axis. So the other thing that's easily measurable is um, the y sub m, with, oh, I'm going to call y sub m, and this is going to be the, the uh, height or location of bright spot. And when I say height or location, I literally mean measured in meters or centimeters or millimeters or like some distance unit. You can literally take a ruler and you can literally hold the ruler up to the screen and you can measure the distance between the center and, and whatever bright spot you're interested in, whether it be the first bright spot or the second bright spot or the third bright spot. And you can literally measure that distance with the ruler. So that's, that's what um, I'm talking about with Y sub M. It's, it's the physical distance between the center and that the location of that bright spot. Now, it just so happens that we have similar triangles here. Um, this triangle here with the path difference and the slit and theta is a similar triangle. And when I say similar triangle, I, I don't just colloquially mean similar triangle. Um, I, I mean the mathematical definition of similar triangle. Let me just move this equation down over here for a second. Um, the other triangle we have is this one. We have y, m, we have l, and then this is theta, and it's the same theta. So, I mean, if, if you're a little bit rusty with similar triangles, um, I believe in high school they were taught in the grade nine math curriculum, and they've sort of been used as math tricks in grades nine, 10, 11, and first year, um, subsequently, I guess I should say. So we introduced similar triangles in grade nine because they're just such a useful trick uh, in, in math and I guess geometry in general. So seeing as how we are dealing with geometry here, there we go. We're, we're invoking the special triangle, not special, similar triangles uh, math trick. So these are similar triangles. And if they're similar triangles, then the, 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 the ratios are the same. So here in this triangle, we can say, well, um, sine theta here is going to be ym over the hypotenuse. So cool, we're, we're a little bit closer. Sine theta before, we just couldn't measure at all. 
However, we still don't know the hypotenuse. And I, I guess maybe you could measure the hypotenuse in real life because, you know, you could measure the distance between um, the screen you could, uh, and, and the, um, the slit. And then you could like use a ruler maybe and go on an angle and measure the distance between the slit and the, and the fringe. But I mean, that's a little bit tedious and maybe not so accurate. So here, here's the approximation that we're saying. We can say if, if L is, is sufficiently bigger than D, and don't forget D, the slit width. Remember, um, uh, or not D, we'll say, we'll say YM, sorry. Eh, YM, either way. Um, if, if L is sufficiently large compared to, compared to the distance of the fringe, meaning, what does this mean? It means you're not holding the screen right up against, you're not holding it like three millimeters away or two millimeters away or a few centimeters away. Um, from the slit. It means you have an arm span, half an arm span, a, you know, a meter, half a meter, or two meters, you know, a, 10 meters. You know, you have a, a, a really nice long distance between um, the slit and, uh, and, and the double slit and the screen. So if L is sufficiently large, then we can actually see that sine theta approximately equals tan theta. And this is because if you look at sine theta, sine theta is going to be y sub m over the hypotenuse, but tan theta is opposite over adjacent. So this is going to be y sub m over adjacent L. And really, I shouldn't be putting an equal sign here. I should be putting an approximately equal sign here. So let's, let's look at why this is true. Well, if L is really long, if L is really long compared to Y sub M, then the hypotenuse of this triangle really isn't that much different than the adjacent side. I mean, if I had to draw a separate diagram to sort of, uh, you know, illustrate this, right? This would be Y sub M, this would be L, this would be the hypotenuse, this would be theta. You know, if Y sub M is pretty small relative to L or, or L is really big relative to Y sub M, then the hypotenuse and the adjacent side are pretty close to each other, okay? So that's what we're doing here. We're saying, okay, if you hold the screen far enough away, then sine theta approximately equals tan theta. So, you know, the real equation, the real equation, yes, is sine theta equals uh, y sub m over the hypotenuse, and we know that this equals m lambda over d, okay? However, you can approximate this to saying tan theta, which would be y sub m over l equals m lambda over d. And the reason why this is, is helpful is because a hypotenuse in, in, in a lab setting or in real life is sort of hard harder to measure, but L, L is super easy. L is a straight line, there's no angles involved, um, less experimental error when you take that measurement, and uh, super, it's a super easy quantity to measure. So this is another way we can represent the bright spots, or if you, well, as the high school math teachers would say, cross multiply, which I absolutely hate saying, uh, really what you're doing is you're multiplying both sides by D, so you can cross that out. And then you're also multiplying both sides by L. So you can cross that out. And then what you end up getting for an equation is you get, um, uh, well, I mean, I guess it depends what you're, what you're solving for. You can get Y M D equals M lambda L. Um, or if you want to solve for, for the location, like, like the coordinate, the Y coordinate of of the, um, of the bright spot, you could just isolate for y sub m, m lambda l over d. And here, this is a much more useful equation. So I'm gonna write that here. It's a much more useful equation because there is no theta value which we, we were not able to measure, if you, if you recall. So there's no theta value. Uh, and 
it provides a physical location, meaning like y sub m might be like, I don't know, four centimeters away from the central maximum. That's helpful because you can, you can quantify that, you can search for four centimeters, you can verify it with a, easily with a ruler. Um, previously, we weren't able to, to, like the previous equation was insightful, but not really useful in, in practice. So this is another equation for the bright spots. Okay, and the dark spots follow something similar. Uh, although instead of m lambda, it's going to be m plus a half times lambda times l over d. So it's a very similar construct. It, with the dark spots, we're still making the same approximation. We're still making sine theta approximately equal to tan theta. So, okay. Um, that pretty much concludes the double slit experiment. Um, the premise is, I don't want to say simple because that's misleading. It, it's it really threw physicists for a loop for a very long time. So calling it simple is a complete understatement. But um, in the context of this class, I guess is what I'll say. Um, it's, it's not so bad. It, it's fairly straightforward. It, it's one, maybe one and a half equations. They're kind of the same equation. Um, it's really only one or two equations, and the premise boils down to superposition of light, um, and and the path difference being either lambda or half a half multiple of lambda. So that's the main premise for Young's double slit experiment. Now, interestingly, uh, next we can move on to something called the single slit. Now, you would think, oh, single is not double. You'd think the single slit is, is easier than the double slit experiment. Uh, however, weirdly, it, it's not. Um, conceptually, the, the double slit experiment was reasonably easy to get on board with because you could see how there were two different light waves that could interfere with each other. However, um, a single slit, that's, that's not so true. Um, now, weirdly enough, I don't know why this slide uses this example to illustrate the single slit diffraction, because this isn't quite single slit. It's still a, it's a sort of a double slit because you have two light waves coming in. Um, so I, I don't know why they chose to do that. Anyway, that aside. So uh, the double, the sorry, the single slit experiment is extra weird because you get a very similar diffraction pattern. Um, similar, not the same, but similar. Um, and, and the whole premise of, of the double slit, and the reason we were able to get our heads wrapped around the double slit is because we had two separate light sources that were interfering with one another. And with a single slit, you don't have two separate light sources. You have light coming in, and that's it. So the fact that we still get a very similar pattern if we take out the middle slit is just mind boggling. I mean, physicists were happy. Well, Young, I guess the guy whose experiment it was, they were, they were happy when they figured out the explanation of this. And they were like, oh, light was acting like a wave. This makes total sense. We know properties of waves, superposition of waves. And, um, you know, it makes total sense. However, with a single slit, all of that intuition goes right out the window because we now no, no longer have two waves to interfere with. Um, in reality, what then, what's, what's actually happening is the one wave that is coming through the one single slit is actually interfering with itself. And if you think this is a sort of hand wavy, or if you think this will be a hand wavy explanation, you're absolutely correct. It will be a hand wavy explanation because um, we are sort of pushing a square through a circle cookie cutter. Um, we are trying to explain a single slit diffraction pattern in terms of the wave nature of light. And it, it's, it's possible. Can you, can you put a square piece of cookie dough through a circular cookie cutter? Yes, and you can force it to be a circle at the end of it, but that doesn't mean that was the right tool to use for a square piece of cookie dough. So that's what's gonna happen here. We're gonna force this into the wave nature of light, even though it makes more sense in context of quantum mechanics. But for the sake of this class, for the sake of the curriculum, 
Um, it, there is a somewhat valid interpretation under the wave nature of light. So that's, that's what the textbooks all present, all of the textbooks present it this way. Um, they just neglect to explain that there's a better explanation in quantum mechanics. And, and they also neglect to explain that we're actually sort of forcing this into a chapter that it doesn't really belong. But anyway, so let's, let's go ahead and show you the sort of hand wavy uh, explanation. So the way in which we can sort of convince ourselves that this is the same sort of idea as the Young's double slit experiment is you can think of when light comes in, you can think of light being uh, comprised of many individual rays. So if you have a single slit instead of a dou double slit, uh, you can picture a light beam, let's say red like laser light or uh, what have you, um, coming in, but it doesn't come in as one ray, it comes in as many tiny rays as you see here. Okay, and um, what we do is we end up taking pairs of, of rays. So we're trying to convince ourselves that the pattern that we see, which is very similar to double slit, um, we're trying to convince ourselves because of that similarity between um, the diffraction pattern of a single slit and the diffraction pattern of, of a double slit. Because of that similarity, we, we, we as scientists are, are trying to force the understanding and force the analysis to be similar to that of a double slit. Now in reality, like I said, quantum mechanics explains this phenomenon in a much better way. However, um, on the premise of trying to force it into being a double slit, you look at pairs of rays. So for instance, the first ray down here, maybe not, let's not use red, but maybe use green. The first ray down here, which is closest to, um, you know, let's say the bottom, is let's say paired with the middle one. So the middle one being either ray three or ray four or something like that. And uh, when you have these two rays that you're looking at, these two separate rays, then you can start talking about a path difference again between those two rays. And again, if the path difference is an even multiple, not even, uh, a whole number multiple of lambda, then you get constructive interference. If the path difference is a 0.5 multiple of lambda, then you're going to get destructive interference. And that's, that's pretty much the explanation is even though there's no, um, even though there's no um, um, slit in the middle to produce two separate slits, um, when the light ray comes in, the way in which we're, we're choosing to interpret this, this phenomenon is we are pairing the waves off. And uh, when we look at pairs of waves, then we can sort of force it to be the same sort of idea as a double slit. So that's pretty much what we're doing here uh, in this diagram here. So if you look at the first ray and the middle ray, for instance, um, you can do the same sort of uh, analysis of, you know, this being the equilateral triangle, there's your cross, so this part here is your path difference, right? And if the path difference is half a lambda, then, you know, you're going to get destructive interference. If the path difference is full lambda, then uh, you're going to get uh, constructive interference. Now we have a difference of uh, a different change in variables now. So instead of D, the separation distance, um, now we're going to have W, the width of that single slit. So um, from from left to right, we're calling W, the width of that slit, from like the whole width. So if we're pairing off the waves, we take the first wave and the middle wave, and um, that would make that would make, um, this is the angle here, um, there's the right angle, so that would make the adjacent side width over 2, if you can see that here. So the adjacent side, ADJ, is width over 2, and um, that makes the opposite side, as you can see here, that makes the opposite side W over 2 times sine theta. So um, you get the W over 2 sine theta on the left, you get half lambda on the right, and then the halves will cancel, and then you end up getting, oops, and then you end up getting this equation for the dark spots. So 
there's a small difference between the Young's double slit and the single slit experiments. Um, in the single slit, the dark spots happen when you have integer, oops, integer does not start with an N, integer multiples of lambda. And this is opposite, opposite to that of double slit. Double slit when you have one lambda, two lambda, three lambda, four lambda, um, that is when you have constructive interference or bright spots. Um, here, we, the path difference is still a, a fractional dependence on lambda, like 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5. You can see here, it's still, still a 0 0.5 multiple of lambda. But the reason why you don't see that in the final equation is because on the other side, you get the w over 2 on the other side. So the, the over twos will cancel. So it masks uh, it masks this, the 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 concept that in fact in reality we are still looking for the same thing. We are still looking for the path difference to be uh, a half multiple of lambda. But because the half cancels out later on, um, you know it, it's it masks that. So please keep that in mind. You're always for destructive interference. You're still looking for 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5 lambda shift, but with single slit, um, the two, the over two will cancel. So that concept is sort of hidden. Okay, so here's what you see with a single slit diffraction. And if we were in person right now, I would literally do this for you in person. You know, uh, the physics labs do have lots of single and double slits. We could, you know, I could borrow and take into the lecture. I have lots of laser pointers, different colors, red, blue, green, etc. And I could show you, I could literally show you what a single slit diffraction looks like versus a double slit diffraction. And I think they're really cool to see in person, but unfortunately, not in person. Um, so I can't do that, but I can try my best to talk about them. So here, um, this is a measure of intensity versus location. So the central bright spot will be very bright very, very, very bright. And then the intensity shrinks over time. So um, is there a, um, no, they don't have, okay. Um, maybe, hold on, maybe I can quickly find uh, an image online just to kind of show you what that's gonna look like. Mm, here we go. That's a not a great depiction, but let's try it nonetheless. So let me show you guys um, what I'm sort of talking about here. So hopefully you can see, let's see here. Can you see? Yeah, hopefully you can see my, my um, Google screen now. So here, this is an example of a single slit uh, diffraction pattern. So you see in the center here, and I can't, I know you can't tell where I'm, oh yes, you can, you can see my cursor. So in the center here, you can see it's so bright that the camera is sort of saturating and you see the, you know, you, it's what cameras usually do. It, it, even a strip of light kind of goes blurry. So it's so bright here that the camera is sort of going blurry. And then there's a dark spot and then a bright spot, a dark spot, a bright spot, a dark spot, a bright spot, a dark spot, a bright spot. But you can see uh, as you increase the fringe number, the intensity of the light diminishes because most of the light is passing you know, straight and hitting the wall straight behind the slit. So, um, but some of the light is bending, some, but less of the light is bending. So as you go out, um, you are getting an intensity that drops pretty quickly. So that's all um, this, that's all this diagram is saying here, is that the intensity of the light at the center is very bright, but the intensity as you increase on the fringe number is decreasing. Okay, um, this is just a summary of that equation, which we just derived for you. Okay, so here is an example. So we've done a lot of talking, we've derived a lot of equations. Let's do an example. Light waves with two different wavelengths, 632 nanometers, 
which would be about orange, uh, and 474 nanometers pass simultaneously through, 474 would be bluish, uh, sim pass simultaneously through uh, a single slit whose width is known to be, okay, there's, there's a lot of numbers here. So lambda, oh, not, let's not do red. Lambda well, one, say, it's gonna equal 632 nanometers. Uh, lambda two is gonna equal 474 nanometers. Um, slit width, single slit, okay, so single slit's important. So W equals 7.15 times 10 to the minus five meters. Uh, and strike a screen, L equals 100, or not 100, uh, 1.2 meters away from the slit. Two diffraction patterns are formed. Obviously there are two because there's two different light sources, lambda one and lambda two. So two diffraction patterns are formed on the screen. What is the distance in centimeters between the common centers of the diffraction patterns and the first occurrence of a dark fringe uh, from one pattern falling on top of a dark fringe of another pattern? Ooh, that was a long sentence, let me. Let me read that again. Two diffraction patterns are formed. What is the distance between, okay, between the center of the diffraction pattern and the first occurrence of a dark fringe from one pattern falling on the top of a dark fringe from the other pattern? So it's where the first two dark fringes line up. Okay, so we want dark fringes with single slit. Okay, so I make note here that we are on Single slit, all right, so I'm gonna, what's the equation for a single slit? There we go, this is for dark, I believe. We scroll up, yeah, dark, okay. So this is gonna be D sine theta equals M lambda. Well, that's not, well, I guess it, I use W here, so W sine theta equals M lambda, okay. And we said that that sine theta was hard to measure. We talked about that in the, in the um, double slit. So we can actually represent tan or sine theta to be approximately tan theta. And tan theta, we said, if you recall from the picture, ym l theta. So tan theta is gonna be opposite over hypotenuse. This is the source of the light. This is the screen. This is the slit. So uh, tan theta is going to be y m over l equals m lambda. So here we go. Here's our equation. And uh, we want to know, what do we want to know? What is the distance? So we want to know y sub m. What is the distance? which is y sub n or m. Oh, there was a spider over there before and now it's gone. I was trying to look at it for the past 10 minutes and now I don't know where it went. That scares me. Anyway, um, so the, what is the difference between, let's see here, the common center and the first occurrence of the dark fringes that overlap? Okay, so the first dark fringe of lambda one, uh, easy to calculate, but it may not and it won't, land on the same dark fringe for lambda two. So we're not looking for this, the first dark fringe. We're looking for the first dark fringe that overlaps with the dark fringe from the other lambda. So <clears throat> let's solve for the location oops, of the dark fringe. So ym is gonna equal m, let's say one lambda one l over uh, w, and this is going to be the location of dark fringe. Okay, and we want to know when the locations of the dark fringe equal each other. So let me, I, I'm going to have to, oops. Okay, so we want to know when Y M from one 
equals ym from two. We wanna know when the dark fringes from lambda one overlays the dark fringe of lambda two. So this is gonna be m1 lambda one L over W equals m2 lambda two times L over W. Mm, cool. So here we can see that whether you use light source number one or light source number two, the distance between the slit and the screen, L, is the same, and the width of the slit, whether you use light source one or light source two, is the same. So we see here that the L and the W will cancel, and we end up getting M1 lambda one equals M2 lambda two. Okay, and they wanna know when this happens the first time. The first time meaning the minimum number that you can get. So here, um, uh, you know, you can pick M1 and M2 to make these things equal, but there's infinitely many combinations of M1 and M2. We want the first one, so the lowest number of, of them. So we can say something like, I don't know, uh, M2, equals m1 over oh, m1 lambda 1 over lambda 2 for instance so we can solve for lambda 2 and we can solve for m2 in terms of m1 and uh, then we can go ahead and solve for for ym so here we can say you know y m2 is going to equal, I don't know, m2 lambda 2 L over W. We know what m2 is. m2 is going to be m1 lambda 1 over lambda 2 times lambda 2 times L over W. And here we are canceling lambda 2. And you are getting m1 lambda 1 L over W equals ym. And here you can simply, um, the smallest one is, is when uh, m equals one, I think. Is that the smallest value of m? Yeah, the smallest value of m is one here. So here you just pick m to be one. And you plug in your values. You have, you have lambda 1, you have L, and you have W. And you can solve for the location. So it all hinged from the wording. The wording said, uh, well, the wording told us what we needed. The wording told us we needed um, the, dark, the location of the dark spots to be equal to each other. And then that got us our relationship here. This got us our uh, relationship between M2 and M1, okay? And then once we had that relationship between them, you could go back to either one. You could have solved for M1 if you wanted to and then plug it into lambda one. Uh, I happened to solve for M2, because why not? And I plugged it into to the lambda two equation. So either way, it doesn't matter how you plug it in, um, your YM value should be the same either way because it's the same relationship. So there you go. That's how you do that question. Okay, um, that's pretty much all there is to, um, ooh, that's really small, there we go. That's pretty much all there is to um, the double slit experiments. It boils down to two rays of light interfering with each other and the, the, the manner in which they interfere with each other is dependent on the path difference between them. And even though a single slit traditionally or uh, uncommonly uh, doesn't have two different rays, you can sort of force it into the same construct as a double slit by pairing off the rays, you know, with the, the ray on the very end in the middle and then you know, going from the ray on the middle to the, to the opposite end. So you can pair off the rays that way. So you can force it to sort of be a double slit analysis, even though it's a single slit. And uh, the diffraction patterns um, were very similar between single slit and double slit, minor differences. 
So there is there isn't really much to um, the the double slit experiment or the single slit. Um, the last topic we're going to cover, well, almost last topic we're going to cover in the wave nature of light is something called thin films. And I think the very last one we're going to talk about is, is polarization. So light is very cool. Um, we talked a lot about the path difference needing to be an integer multiple of lambda for, for super uh, constructive superposition. Or if you want destructive superposition, then it's got to be a 0.5 multiple of lambda. And it just so happens that there's uh, another application to this principle in addition to the single and double slit. Now, I'll, I'll agree readily that single and double slit experiments are, are probably not useful in like 99% of the people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, so, you know, there's that. However, this topic, thin films, very applicable to everyday lives and you don't even you don't even realize it. So hopefully this is kind of interesting and enlightening. So consider this thought experiment momentarily. If you have sunlight coming in, let's say you have a ray of sunlight coming in and it strikes a film of oil. Now, maybe some of you have oil stains from your parents' car on the driveway. Maybe you've spilled some gasoline before. Um, maybe, maybe you've cooked and you've had a, a, a thin layer of oil on top of some water in a measuring cup or something like that. Who knows? If, if when, don't forget, okay, so the light's going to come in here. Let me change my color. Light's going to come in here. Part of the light is going to reflect, right? It's like when you look into, um, you know, a window. Yes, you can see out of the window. Light passes through glass. But if you look hard enough through the window, you actually see a very faint reflection of yourself, right? So part of the light gets reflected back. Part of the light goes through. And I think uh, a student asked a very good question. Um, how do you know the proportion of, is, in physics, is there a way to measure the proportion of light that goes through? And I said, yes, absolutely. There's something called the reflection coefficients and the transmission coefficients. And they are very much a thing um, in second year physics and fourth year physics, um, but just not this class. But it is definitely a thing. So when, when sunlight strikes, let's say oil or water or, you know, anything that's kind of trans transparent or almost transparent, part of it's going to reflect but part of it's going to go through and it strikes water below. And here, here's really the key. It doesn't necessarily have to be oil and water. The, the key here is it has to be three different materials. So material one, material two, and then material three. And here's why that's important because the light that gets transmitted into material two, in this case, the oil, then it will continue traveling through the oil. And when it hits the new boundary, in this case between oil and water, again, that's a new transition. So part of the light's going to go through, part of the light's going to go through, but part of the light is going to get reflected back up. Now, the, the light that goes through, no problem. In fact, when you look into a pool, the light that goes through, it, it, it's why you can see inside of a pool. Because there's obviously light that goes into the water. But there is a little bit of light that gets reflected back at that boundary and comes back up. And so that's why, that's why in this diagram, you see two light rays going into this person's eye. Here, oops, here you see the reflected ray And here you see the transmitted and then reflected ray. Now, two light waves are traveling over top of each other. This means they will superimpose. Let me write that down. So two light rays, two light rays, will be traveling together, thus 
they will superimpose. What does this mean? There's the path difference again. If the two light rays are, are uh, if the path difference between the two light rays is a whole number multiple of lambda, then when they superimpose, they will have constructive interference. If, if the two light rays have a path difference of a 0.5 multiple of lambda, they will have destructive interference. And then you may not see anything at all. It would appear black, which is kind of really cool. So this is dependent on um, either constructive or destructive is dependent on the path difference between the two light rays. And the path difference in the single or, or double slit was governed by that little tiny triangle, you know, M, M lambda over D. Um, in this case, what is the path difference? Well, the path difference is going to be twice, of, twice the thickness of, in this case, the oil. The path difference is going to be this delta x value down, and then it's going to travel back up another delta x value. So the path difference in this case is going to be, oops, 2 times delta x, where delta x is the, why won't you write the x there? There we go, x. And that's going to be the thickness. Why is it not? That is so strange. Not by a Windows machine. Oh, come on. Why are you not writing? 2 times delta x, where delta x is the thickness. OK, that seems to hold. I don't know why. Maybe red doesn't like writing in red. I don't know. So the path difference is going to be a function of the thickness of this film or this oil or this material. So clearly, um, if you have oil sitting on water, it won't necessarily cause fun shapes or patterns because it depends on the thickness of that oil sitting on water. Now, if you had, do I have, no. If you had, let's say, um, um, well, let, here, let's picture this to be, let's say the driveway. And let's say we have oil, oil's black. So, well, eh, whatever. If we had an oil spill on the driveway, ooh, what happened there? Drive, driveway. Okay, if we had an oil spill on the driveway, oil uh, or any sort of spill will sort of spread out. Uh, it will be very thick at the center, and it will be very thin, thin as the spill spreads out. Now, the reason why this is important is because it's a continuous distribution. You know, uh, it, obviously, it, it's not like it's a step function where, you know, all of, all of a sudden we're missing some thicknesses in the middle. If, if you have a really thick part and it's a continuous sort of spill of oil, which of course it is, then um, you're going to get every thickness between the thickest point and zero. Why is this important? Um, and, oh, I guess I should say here um, the important takeaway here, important takeaway is that um, the thickness is continuous. Now, the reason why this is important is because, as I've explained to you, the path difference is a function of the thickness of the material. So this is why it's important, because if for a certain thickness it does not result in a fun pattern, then you're not going to see anything. But there will be a thickness where you do see either constructive or destructive interference. And um, 
you can't always set up an experiment and a certain thickness of film specifically for that. You're never going to get it dead on. But if you get a continuous distribution that goes from thick to thin or thick to zero, then at some point along there, you're going to get the perfect thickness for either constructive interference or destructive interference. And then you're going to get a bright spot and a dark spot. So what we have here, um, because we shouldn't be killing the environment, we shouldn't just be spilling oil on the ground, although in the event your car is leaking oil. Actually, if you, if you do have an oil stain on your driveway, it, when it's sunny out, go look at it, move your car, but then go look at it in the sun. And if it's fresh, if it's dry, then you're not gonna see anything. But if it's fresh and still kind of wet, you'll notice rainbows in it. And the rainbows in your oil spill will look very similar to these. Now, instead of damaging the environment further and spilling oil on the street, um, we can replicate this by taking um, a flat piece of glass, flat glass, and here we have something called a plano convex lens. Plano convex, plano meaning one side is a plane, flat like a flat like a plane, and the other side is convex. We studied the optics unit. I told you we weren't going to study the optics of plano convex lenses, and we're still not. Um, I'm just telling you what it's called, it's called a plano convex lens. And when you flip it upside down, as shown in the picture, um, this mimics an oil spill in the sense that the path difference, path difference, oops, come on. Um, in that the path difference is governed by the air, the air space between the lens and the flat glass floor. And again, we have a continuous distribution. Here, you have no, no space. Oh, come on. Here, you have no space. And here, you have a large space. So at some point in that air gap, you're going to get the perfect air space to have both constructive and destructive interference. And what you end up getting is you get the interference pattern. So this interference pattern um, is a result of having, uh, is a result of thin films. Or in this case, it's an air wedge, but same thing. So if you looked on the driveway with a, a wet oil stain, this, this is almost exactly what you would see. It's really cool. And um, these are called Newton's rings. These are called Newton's rings. Now, again, I don't know why they're called Newton's rings. Uh, Newton did uh, create or well, invent the laws of optics. So maybe he was the one who stumbled on these specifically, but with, with, other, um, with, with other interference patterns with, with uh, thin films, we don't call them Newton rings, but specifically with an air wedge and when the diffraction patterns are in a circle, we call them Newton rings, semantics. But anyway, that's not the point. Point being is, again, with the path difference. The main theme in this chapter is that the path difference between two waves is very important about how two waves will superimpose. The path difference is an as an integer multiple of lambda, you're going to get constructive interference. And if it's not a, not, um, if it's a half multiple, it'll go to dark. And if it's anywhere in the middle, you know, if it's like 0 0.75, then you're not going to get anything nice. You're going to change the frequency. You're going to change the color. And then that's where you get all these pretty colors from. Now, interestingly, um, that is, that's an application of it. Um, that is not as cool of an application as what I want to show you. So here, um, here, let me just explain an application. Anti-glare glasses or windows. So for those of you who do wear glasses, I don't wear glasses. So I, I can't sympathize with those who do wear glasses, but you know, when you buy glasses, a lot of them now have an anti-glare coating on them. 
Um, and same thing with your, your car windows. They say, you know, when you're driving, you get the glare from street lights or what have you. And now with, with windshields, the fancier cars or the more expensive models, they'll, they'll come with an anti, uh, an anti reflective coating. This is exactly how eyeglasses and windows have the anti glare coating is they have the glass. They have the glass and then they have a coating coating and um, they have reverse engineered the thickness of coating that they need to have the path difference completely like be, be half half lambda or an integer multiple of half lambda and then um, whatever light rays, whatever light rays come in and then get reflected or go through, come back out and then get reflected. Um, they figured out that this coating is going to have a path difference of 0 0.5 lambda or some multiple of 0 0.5 lambda because, you know, could a factory make a coating that's 0 0.5 lambda when lambda is in the nanometer range? Probably not, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be exactly half lambda. It could be 1.5 lambda. It could be 100.5 lambda. It could be 1,000.5 lambda. As long as it's a, a 0.5 lambda off, then that's all you need. So there's got a, a path difference of, of um, point, well, I guess technically I should say m plus 0 0.5 lambda. And then this is going to result in no reflection because it's going to be destructive interference. So that's super, super cool. And that's how anti-reflective glasses and windows and windshields are made. It's, it's through this premise of, of thin films and the path difference, the idea of the path difference. So that's super cool. Um, another less interesting, well, I think it's just as interesting, but for you guys, I, I, I assume it will be less interesting. A, a less interesting application of, of thin films interference and, and Newton rings is in engineering. So if you make a piece of, uh, well, anything really, manufacturer piece, whether it be concrete or plastic or steel, um, you want to test the, the tensile strength and the manufacturing quality of, of the material or the object that you built. And this is really useful in engineering because, um, you know, airplane parts, for instance, airplane parts have to be tip top. You, you don't want to crack in your wing in the middle of a flight. Oh God, that would be terrible. Um, so you need a way to sort of test whether or not the wing is in good shape. So what you do is you can apply a little bit of pressure on the material and let's, let's for a second assume it's, it's um, something transparent, like a piece of plastic. If you twist it or apply a little bit of pressure to it, then you are deforming the plastic, just a little bit, just a little bit. And when you shine light through it, when you deform the plastic, you're changing the, the if there's an air gap, you're changing the air gap. Um, you're also changing the index of refraction a little bit because you're, you're changing the, the density of the material. And when you shine light through it, what you're doing is um, if there's regions in that material that are non-homogeneous, you know, when you, when you, when you deform it, you, there are certain regions in there that become slightly more dense than other ones. Then um, when you shine light through it, if it hits a different index of refraction, it will refract and then interfere with each other. So here you can actually see, oops, you can actually see the stress points of an object using this idea. So, you know, let's say you make, 
Let's say you make a prosthetic leg, something that takes a lot of weight, something that moves, something that has to be reliable. Um, and you want to make sure your design is good and it's robust and there isn't any flaws in it. Well, what you do is once you make your prosthetic leg, you can apply some tensile strength to it in the lab and um, you can figure out where the pressure points are in this prosthetic leg. And then you can make sure that whatever engineering design that you, you had um, is, is robust and strong and well made in the locations that take a lot of the the, the pressure and, and the force. And the same idea can be done to airplane wings and bridges and, and a bunch of things. Now, when things aren't see-through, you can't use light, but luckily light is only useful for our eyes because we can see it. Um, there are other, and we'll talk about this in the next chapter, um, light is, is simply an electromagnetic wave. So there are lots of other frequencies of, of light that our eyes, our human eyes cannot see, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. So instead of using visible light, you could use things like microwave radiation or something like that. Something safe, you know, not x-ray. I mean, I suppose you could use x-rays as well, but um, they're not safe for us to be around. But something that is more safe for us to be around, um, infrared, anything infrared is, is typically very safe. And you can blast the object with infrared radiation or microwave radiation or, or what have you. And if you had a sensor on the other end to mimic an eyeball, um, to, to see the reflection of these, these light rays that are passing through, that are light rays that our eyes can't see because they're infrared, but a detector can see them. And then you can map them on a computer screen as if your computer eye can see them. And then that would be a way for you to, to do this sort of tensile testing on non-translucent materials like bridges or airplane wings. So again, a very cool application of thin films and interference patterns. Um, I, I think that's so cool. You guys, maybe not, I don't know. Um, maybe you guys are, are more in, interested in, in how your anti-glare glasses work. And, and don't get me wrong, that, that alone is also really cool and very important because a lot of people wear glasses. And, you know, I know, I mean, my dad's worn glasses since he was quite young and, and other people I know who wear glasses, they say the glare gives them a headache. You know, they don't like wearing their glasses all day because they get the glare in their eyes and it gives them a headache. Um, also, your computer screen. People who spend a lot of time on your computer screen, that, that glass covering on your computer screen, um, it, there's a bit of a glare to it. So some of the more expensive computers will have ex more expensive glass and they'll have an anti-glare cover on it. And then that is easier on the eyes if you are sitting and working on the computer for a long stretch of time. Now, on the same idea of the computer screen, um, that brings me to the last topic in the wave nature of light called polarization. As you know, light is a wave, and light, because it's a wave, can be thought of something like a sinusoidal wave, right? Now, in real life, we're three-dimensional. So light, when it's shining, light can uh, be, be a wave that oscillates, say, up and down, let's say, in the y direction. But we've got three-dimensional space. So light rays could also just as easily oscillate horizontally, let's say in the x direction. Now our, our eyes, they can't tell the difference between vertical light and horizontal light. To our eyes, light is light. However, it's still a wave. So there's a, a sort of direction of oscillation, either up or down or left to right. Now, this is where polarization comes in. Polarization means you are filtering out all the other types of light rays that are not oscillating in the desired direction. So I could say, all right, I want polarized light. What does polarized light mean? It means if I have a light source from say a candle or a, a light bulb, that is unpolarized light. That is giving off light in all directions of all, di of all orientations, Y, X, whatever. 45 degree angles, whatever. If I want to polarize that light, then what I want to do is I want to create a filter that blocks all the light rays that are not traveling in the desired direction. So you can, you can make your polarizing material um, specifically to filter out all the horizontal light and only let in vertical light. Or you can, 
you can design it to be filtering out all the vertical light and only pass through horizontal light. However you want to make your, your polarizer, you can. But that's what polarization is. So you can think of it sort of like um, slats in a fence, so to speak. So here's what we would call the polarizer. And let's say we had vertical light coming in. Well, vertical light coming in that passes through a vertical fence or a vertical polarizer will pass right through. It won't even notice the fence is there. However, if you had horizontal light in the plus and minus x direction, trying to get through a vertical slat, that's not going to work very well. So on the other side, you have no wave. So it, it literally acts as a physical barrier. The polarizer, or in this case, the vertical polarizer, does not allow for light of any other orientation to pass through, only the orientation that is useful for you. And this means all the light on the other side um, becomes lined up and parallel and in the same direction. And it's a way in which we can filter light. So we use polarizers to, um, I don't want to say control light, but um, to filter, to filter um, scattering or scattered light. So um, it's a way in which we can control uh, all the orientations of all the light rays, the directions of the light rays, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, light normally just spreads out in, you know, radially and it's kind of all over the place. So this is our way to sort of control light, filter out what we don't need. Um, we talked about Young's double slit experiment. You know, you'd have to, you'd have to put polarized light into Young's double slit experiment because the light rays need to come in all parallel, all coherent, you know, all the same orientation. Otherwise it doesn't work. So this is a way in which we can achieve that. Now, some of you might have noticed that, um, you know, back in the nineties and early two thousands, this was really popular you would have um, a polarizing computer screen cover. And this is where, you know, if you put the polarizer on your computer screen, if you look straight at it, you can still see it. But if you look from an angle, left or right, it's like a privacy screen, um, it turns dark. And this is done through a polarizer. They literally have a polarizer sheet that you can just tape over top of your computer screen. And what that does is, all the light coming out of your computer screen is immediately pushed through the polarizer and it traps or filters all of the light that is not traveling in the same direction. So I don't know, it could be a vertical polarizer, horizontal polarizer, whatever it happens to be. Um, but it makes sure all the light coming out is in the same direction and traveling uh, straight, kind of like a spotlight straight at your face. So if you look from the sides, there are no light rays that are, that are scattering left or scattering right. So if you look from the left or from the right, it's gonna look black because there are no light rays traveling left or traveling right. And so they call it a privacy screen. So anyway, that's, that's polarization. And um, an interesting application is you can actually block all the light by using multiple polarizers. And this is if you, oh, well, who goes to, please do not go to a movie theater during COVID, but you know, many years ago when 3D movies with those 3D glasses were very popular, I think Avatar, um, James Cameron's Avatar was the first movie that had like the, the modern 3D glasses. Um, they use polarizers. I, I don't know how old you guys are. Maybe you might remember from like the 90s, the original 3D. I think the first 3D movie ever was Jurassic Park. And it had those red and green glasses. Those did not act on polarizers. Those act on tricking your eyes into filtering out the red light and the green light. James Cameron's movie, Avatar, um, it used black, black polarizer glasses. And it did that um, in, in a very, very creative way. It, it manipulated the light uh, using polarization. And maybe after the movie, they ask you to recycle your glasses. Maybe you didn't. If you didn't, you might notice that if you pop out the lenses of those glasses 
and you can rotate, them, lay them on top of each other and rotate them, you can block out, it turns completely black, no light at all passes through. And the way, the, the reason or the way that works is because if you have, let's say, a vertical pol polarizer, then you know you have, you have unpolarized light coming in. So light that is traveling in all directions, up, down, left, right, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, whatever. If it passes through a vertical fence or a vertical polarizer, then it blocks out all the other kind of light. And the only kind of light that gets passed through is vertical light, if it passes through a vertical polarizer. And then if you happened to place a second polarizer um, that is 90 degrees to the first polarizer, so like let's say horizontal polarizer, then what you're going to do is you say, okay, well, everything here is already vertical. And um, here you're only letting through horizontal light, but none of the light in here is, is horizontal. It's only vertical. So what ends up happening is no light gets through because you're filtering out systematically, you're filtering out uh, horizontal light first, and then you're filtering out vertical light. So if you filter out horizontal and vertical light, those are the only two directions there are. So then nothing gets through. So if you have a pair of old 3D glasses laying around, um, I highly recommend, you know, maybe popping out the lenses and trying to play with that. And you can see that, you know, at a certain orientation, it will turn pitch black. Okay. Uh, we won't talk about um, the Brewster angle or, you know, we, we, we won't talk about the Brewster angle. We don't have time for that. Uh, it would be fun to do, but we, we just don't. But anyway, that's the premise of polarization. That's the concepts behind polarization. Okay, so here's the summary. Um, the double set experiment has two equations. Um, D sine theta equals M lambda for bright spots. D sine theta equals M plus a half lambda for dark spots. And don't forget, we represented sine theta to be approximately equal to tan theta, which was YM over L. And um, we have a similar equation for um, single slits. Um, they're just opposite. So uh, for the single slits, whatever used to be the dark spots are now the bright spots, and whatever used to be the bright spots are now the dark spots. So it's the same equations, but just, uh, well, reversed, frankly. Um, and we talked about polarization. Okay, so it's a pretty short summary, um, but it still needs practice. You still need to go back and practice, have your brain sort of see what it feels like to read a question from this chapter, write the givens from the chapter, determine what equation you need from this chapter, and then solve it. You know, you still need that sort of hands-on practice. So it's uh, very important to, to make sure you go back and do that homework. Uh, tomorrow, maybe in lecture, we'll, if we have some time, we will do some review from the uh, wave nature of light and the electromagnetic unit, if we have time, but we, we have uh, a little bit more material to, to get through. Okay, um, that is the end of the wave nature of light, guys. So I'm going to stop the recording, and before, before resuming the next chapter, which is electromagnetic waves, um, I will take any questions that people may have. So if you're watching on YouTube, I will see you in the next, in the next uh, recording. Ciao for now.